Today on the Everything 80s Podcast, I'm looking at the very best 1980s content available on Disney+. Plus. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today. And Disney Plus, when they first announced this thing, I was like skeptical about it. It's like, how is it going to compete with Netflix? And nothing tops that. Even Prime Video is pretty good. But Netflix, or Disney Plus has now become my favorite streaming service. And I think it's they're really changing the way we're like consuming content. And then how, you know, people are telling stories. You've got obviously the Marvel Cinematic Universe where we no longer have to wait for theatrical releases. They can tell stories on Disney Plus with these amazing series. Like, I don't have to tell you how good WandaVision was. And then Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And as more and more is coming out, they can expand this so much more. Same thing with Star Wars. To have a series like The Mandalorian is incredible. But it's not all just this original programming. There's some amazing throwback content on there, especially 1980s related. So I dug deep through Disney Plus and found 16-ish of uh, the best 80s content I think you will like if you haven't seen it already ready. So that's what we're going to do today. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. Also, if you are a part of patreon.com, I just put a new movie review up there looking at the original alien movie and a lot of amazing stuff about that. And then looking at that big issue is, is it a science fiction movie? Is it a horror movie? Is it both, uh, you know, a lot of the behind the scenes things. So that's over at patreon.com slash eighties. Check your feed. If you're part of it, if you, if you don't know about Patreon, it's a way to support a show like this for, you know, a few bucks a month and there's different tier levels and at each different level, there are different rewards. One being the everything eighties movie club. If yeah, if you want to check it, patreon.com slash eighties or wherever you're listening, there should be a link to it. Okay, here we go. So I dug deep into the bowels of Disney Plus. That sounds terrible. Um, but I'm focusing more on live action stuff, not the cartoons per se, that like the Disney movie cartoons or whatever that came out in the 80s. So more the live action content. Some's family, some's um, not because now they've included the the Star Network. So it's given some more options to some other classic movies. So let's start here. So number 16 is big. Tom Hanks is big. This is a movie that I feel really launched Tom Hanks into the full mainstream. Not that he wasn't, but I think it really sort of elevated him. It's another classic coming of age story about a kid who wished he could be a grown up. Very simple premise, pretty timeless as well. I feel like this could work in any era. And I'm kind of surprised actually we haven't had a remake or reboot of this yet. It seems like it's um, sort of perfect for some form of reboot. When Big came out in 1988, it was an instant hit. That piano dancing scene quickly became one of the most iconic in movie history. It was made on a relatively large size budget of $18 million, but it pulled in a pretty astounding $151 million. Converted for today, it's around $340 million, which is pretty massive for a comedy that's not like a R-rated or over-the-top type comedy. Okay, number two, Flight of the Navigator. If I had to pick my favorite, you know, 1980s related content on Disney Plus, it's probably Flight of the Navigator. And I've covered it on the show before as well with like a full look back at it. You can go back into the earlier episodes to check that out. This movie's from 1986, and it always, I don't know if you ever felt this way about it, but it always had a bit more of a back to the future feel not and not really a Disney vibe to it. I don't know if you ever noticed that that's because Disney had nothing to do with it, but flight of the navigator was created by a Norwegian film company. They ended up going bankrupt. Then another producer had stepped in. They went bankrupt or folded as well, whatever. At this point, Disney stepped in to distribute the film. So that's all they did. They just sort of slapped their name on it and sent it out there. That's why it doesn't, necessarily have that disney feel to it you know and the premise is still amazing it's it's to me it's a very underrated 1980s movie because i think that's the problem a lot of people associate it with as just a disney movie 
uh, and you know maybe not as serious it's a really legitimate good science fiction movie you know you've got this alien spacecraft that kidnaps a 12 year old boy then it drops him off years in the future so everyone has aged except young david so he's now got to try to navigate this whole world and then he ends up having to risk going back to his original home and it, amazing movie. So Flay the Navigator, it made great use of very early CGI, which does hold up today pretty well. Also had uh, Paul Rubens, a.k.a. Pee Wee Herman, in a cameoed, uncredited voice of Max the Robot. So Flight of the Navigator, if you haven't seen it for a while, check it out. Okay, keeping with the serious 80s movies, number three, Wall Street. So... I love Wall Street. It's just, it represents that sort of dark part of the 80s, that that rise of greed, <clears throat> power, corruption, and then the changing nature of stocks and investing in the 1980s. The 80s, like with a lot of the deregulation in markets and investing and financing, it, it, this really gave rise to the yuppie culture and sort of excesses of wealth and the stock market, which was maybe more of like a stuffy sort of thing. I don't know. Now became, um, more mainstream, more like sort of Hollywood. Almost everyone wanted to be involved. There was so much money available now that everyone was getting rich and it was just people tripping over themselves to invest in whatever. So the thing, though, is during the 80s, this is a time of like the insider trading scandal and Wall Street wasn't really going to touch on that, but it found itself sort of right in the middle of everything going on. So it does deal with that issue, the very big, you know, not that it's ever gone away or has changed, but that real big insider trading issue. And like I still watch Wall Street all the time. It's, it's one of those go-to movies for me for some reason where if I'm not sure what to watch, I want to watch Wall Street. I don't know how that happened, you know, up there with like Back to the Future and whatnot. Some of the, if you haven't seen it for a while, some of it is much cheesier than you may remember. Some of the dialogue is absolutely eye rolling, but it's still, it's a classic performance by Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen and one of the great movie characters of all time in Gordon Gecko. It led to a sequel called uh, wall street money never sleeps. It's also on Disney plus it was like, okay ish, but I don't know. It's, it's hard to hold up to the original when wall street came out in 1987 it became a massive influence on many future investors. And a lot of people cite Wall Street as the reason why they got into financing and, and, and working on Wall Street and everything like that. There's a whole new generation that dreamed of becoming Gordon Gecko, and he was a real influence on you know real life uh, Wall Street uh, members. So I've also, this is another review I've done over at patreon.com. I did a full review of that. So if, if you do join up at the um, Everything 80s Movie Club level, that'll be in the archives there. There's a, there's a bunch of different movie reviews and Wall Streets in there. So if you want to check that out. Okay, number four, and we're lightening it up here, the Ewoks cartoon. And so I touched on this in a past episode, a few episodes ago, talking about this new category on Disney Plus called Star Wars Vintage, and it's got a lot of um, 80s content wrapped up into it. So as I'm going through this list, I'm not going to include the original Star Wars trilogy because everyone's already aware of its existence on Disney Plus. There's no point, you know, I don't even consider it really an 80s specific, you know, movie trilogy it, it's more of a timeless series so these ones the next few entries here though are really star wars 80s specific so like i said they quietly rolled out this new star wars vintage category and it's got some awesome stuff the ewoks cartoon being one of them i wonder why they didn't put the droids cartoon in i'm not sure the reason behind that maybe it's coming but the ewoks cartoon came out in 1985 only ran for two seasons but was a pretty creative and sort of mystical cartoon. There, were, there was a lot going on in it. Also had one of the most memorable intros in cartoon history. It, it got, I, I think it was relatively loved because everyone, kids loved anything to do with the Ewoks. It got a tad dark at times, but it's worth going back to check out a few episodes just to sort of remember what it was all about. Okay, number five 
uh, sticking with the Ewoks here, we got Ewoks Caravan of Courage. So I don't know if you remember these, depending on how old you are, but these were a big deal to me and people my age when they first came out. These were live action made for TV Ewok movies, and it was the first real life Star Wars content we got that wasn't in theaters. Caravan of Courage was the first one. It came out in 1984. And it's just, it's a story of a family that crashes into the forest moon of Endor. The kids get separated from the parents and the entire 90 minutes is, you know, them trying to reunite with them and traveling with the Ewoks and everything like that. This was a bit too much. Again, I don't know if you remember this very well. It was maybe a bit too much for younger viewers. I recall it being a little disturbing, a little uh, too intense maybe. Uh, again, you, you know, you look at it today, it doesn't seem like it at all. But, you know, when you're younger, these things sort of resonate a bit more with you. If you go back and watch it now, I don't know if it holds up. It, it's probably more funny to go back and see it. But you kind of you have to put yourself into the shoes of a, of a Star Wars crazed kid in the 80s to know how good this was. This is such a big deal. I remember like the fact it was on a primetime TV um, and this goes right into the next one, number six, Ewoks Battle for Endor. Battle for Endor came out in 1985. It's based around Wicket, the most popular Ewok, probably the only one we knew the name of at the time. Battle for Endor now gets much more into the fantasy realm, and the story involves Wicket and another character, Sindel, having to escape the evil marauders. We meet a few new characters, including uh, Noah and Teak. And again, I don't know if this was Lucasfilm trying out some new characters for future Star Wars content, but either way, again, it, this was mind-blowing that we got these Star Wars movies for free at home. You know, my mom wasn't going to let me see The Empire Strikes Back because I was too young. Even Return of the Jedi, I can't remember when I first saw that, but the Ewoks movie was like perfect. We could make popcorn and we could all sit down and watch it and it was geared towards us. It, this is Again, pretty mind-blowing at the time. Again, Battle for Endor probably doesn't hold up like you remember, but it's an interesting look back on the golden age of Star Wars, right in that mid-80s level when it was just at its peak. I don't know if I'll ever get over, if you remember this, hearing Wicket speak English in this movie. I don't know why I remember that being such a jarring thing. <clears throat> okay, number seven... And I've covered this a ton. I'm sorry if this is a rehash, but this is on Disney Plus. It's called The Story of the Faithful Wookiee. And again, if you've been around here for a while, you know how much I revere the Star Wars holiday special. They, they talk about like the Ewok movies as a way for George Lucas to keep Star Wars in the mainstream by putting it on prime time. The holiday special was the first attempt by George Lucas to put out free content in between movies and keep people reminded that Star Wars exists. He didn't want the popularity of the original Star Wars to fade away, not that it was going to, but he had no idea what this thing was going to evolve into. He didn't know if Star Wars was just a, a fluke one hit wonder. So the Star Wars holiday special was a way to do this. And this aired on the night of November 17th, 1978. Again, you're going to have to go back and listen to my episode all about this. It, it, this is not just the worst thing put out by Star Wars, which is sadly a competitive category now. This is one of the worst things that was ever shown on TV ever. The one I'm not, I won't go too into depth on this because I've covered this so much. The one redeeming part of the special was this nine-minute cartoon that was shown around the halfway point. And it's this little story that features... Um, all the cast members and the original voices on this little expedition to another planet. And it's the very first appearance as well of Boba Fett. So that's what's interesting. What, what's interesting here is that on Disney Plus, they they just drop it out of nowhere with no context. It's there, There's no introduction. It's just like, why is Boba Fett in this thing? If you don't know about the Star Wars holiday special, it's really confusing. And the thing that's interesting is that everyone who had anything to do with the Star Wars holiday special refused to acknowledge its existence. So it's interesting now we're getting more warmed up or to the idea, I guess, of sharing it. The, the Life Day, which is the Wookiee holiday, which is the whole premise of the Star Wars holiday special, is mentioned in the first episode of The Mandalorian, the first season. 
There's also some similar connections in the Lego Star Wars Holiday Special. There's even some sound clips taken from the Wookiees that are put into this Lego special. So, but it's just, it just appears out of nowhere. And the thing is, Disney has the audacity to say that it was released in 2021, which now you know better. It came out in 1978. So again, like I've, I've mentioned, the fact that they are featuring this and, and actually putting it out there is maybe one step closer to the fact they will fully acknowledge the Star Wars Holiday Special exists and give it like a full remastered release. But I can only dream. Okay, number eight, The Great Muppet Caper. And I think, and this is another thing I've covered more in depth on this show, I think The Great Muppet Caper is Jim Henson's best work. It's also my favorite of anything to do with the Muppets. This is also... I think this is his best work because it's the only Muppet movie Jim Henson actually directed. And you, I think it really shows this is Jim Henson at its fine, at his finest. It's this funny, wacky crime story. It's a travel movie. It's a full musical. It capitalized on the format of the Muppet show, which was now, you know, pretty much the most famous show in the world at that point. This is going into 1980, 81. It's fun, it's lively, it's funny, it's absurd, it's everything the Muppets should be. So it, the Great Muppet Caper, Caper came out in 1981. It was filmed in England just like the Muppet Show was, and I've covered the whole Muppet Show. There's a lot of connected episodes to this one if you want to go back. So I've covered the Muppet Show, its entire run was filmed there, and that's the reason Henson wanted to film this in England. He was really loyal to the English crew, the whole system over there. Again, this is one of my favorite movies from growing up. And like I've mentioned on the show, I grew up in England, between Canada and England. So this was a movie we watched over there, which was, I only thought it existed in England. And it was because I was so young, I thought, you know, it's based in England and it was only available in England. And it would blew my mind to see this when I came home, but that's a whole other thing. So also a side note as well, not 80s related. And I've also mentioned on Disney Plus is the exceptionally good Muppets show. This was a one season show. I don't know if you remember, it came out in 2015 on ABC. It's only like 13 episodes long. It's such an underrated and completely missed show. So many people didn't see this thing. It's so good. It's partially created by the people who created the office and it's filmed in that sort of mockumentary style. It's got, it's a bit more adult theme, not that it's inappropriate, but it's just a little more, not that it's highbrow humor, but it's a little more sophisticated adult humor. Okay, number nine. These are in no particular order. I just, you know, number them off because we all love a good list. Number nine, Turner and Hooch. I love this movie. Uh, this was an era, I think, where movies were still made for families. They weren't, you know, necessarily too over the top. They weren't like cartoons. They weren't too like, I don't know. Maybe they're a little cheesy, but they're they're they were movies that were like kind of everyone could enjoy. And this is another Tom Hanks classic. You know, you when you pair a popular actor with a dog, you basically can't miss. And that's what we have with Turner and Hooch. And simple story, you know, this guy has his world turned upside down. He has to take care of a new companion. It's part, you know, crime movie, it's part comedy, it's technically a buddy cop, if you will, came out in 1989. Yeah. Turner and Hooch, check that one out if you haven't for a while. Number 10, while we're on the Tom Hanks thing, Splash. And I'd forgotten, I hadn't seen this movie in a long time. And Splash, I guess, is another one of his breakout roles. This time around, he's playing a character who is a workaholic who's worried he will never fall in love. And it seems sort of like a almost like a warm up for the little mermaid where he meets a real life mermaid played by Daryl Hannah, who we saw in not so great a role in wall street. I don't know. Apparently there was a lot of issues with her in the movie and she didn't like doing it. Didn't want to be there. That's the whole thing. I covered that in the movie review. I forgot splash was directed by Ron Howard. It came out in 1984, which is again, older than I had realized the cast. Again, if you haven't seen this movie for a while, go back. There's some, it's pretty epic cast, including John Candy and Eugene Levy. So it was a pretty decent hit when it came out. It was actually nominated for an Academy award for best screenplay. The thing that's most notable about splash is it's the very first film released by touchstone pictures, 
which was Disney's new label, which was meant to target, you know, more of an adult audience. Number 11, Willow. Willow is pretty awesome. And it's another one of those movies. I thought of it being like an older, like the Dark Crystal, like back in like the early 80s. It actually came out in 1988, later than I expected. This stars Warwick Davis, who played Wicket in Return of the Jedi and the Ewok movies. This is another movie directed by Ron Howard. And Willow is a story about a young, um, his name is Willow Uffgood. And he finds a baby girl, he finds out she's kind of like Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz, and she's destined to end the reign of a wicked queen. He has to protect the baby and then teams up with Val Kilmer, who was, you know, pretty hot at the time in the 80s. It will is a, still a very creative fantasy movie and again, worth checking out if you haven't seen it for a while. I, I didn't realize this or I'd forgotten that it's George Lucas actually produced Willow and he had the idea for it back in 1972. That's how long he'd been playing around with the idea. Okay. Fun fact, sneak peek here. The word on the street is Disney plus is creating a Willow series to debut in 2022. So sign me up for that. Okay. Number 12, the princess bride and I'll get some flack for this, I'm sure. Many call The Princess Bride the perfect movie. I don't personally agree, but like I like The Princess Bride. I just don't love it to death like a lot of people do who can like watch it every week. And I, I totally understand why. I just it's not I don't know for whatever reason, it's just not that sort of top-notch movie to me, even though it is awesome. And me saying that doesn't make it any less epic, and I realize how great it is. And it, it's either way, it's an undeniable classic, and it has been since it came out in since uh, 1987. It's extraordinarily imaginative, super creative. It also stars Andre the Giant, so how can you go wrong with that? If you've ever seen any of the Andre the Giant biographies, you know that he was going through a lot of physical pain during this. And he like, this is, you know, one of the strongest human beings who ever lived, but he was so sort of banged up at the time. He couldn't even like pick up the actors who weighed like a hundred pounds. His back was so bad. And there's a scene where he was on, had to ride on a horse, but they couldn't, you know, he was too big. They had to lower him by these like guidelines, like these wires, from sort of above and he you, you've probably heard uh, the legendary Andre the Giant drinking stories where he would drink like cases of wine at a time there's a story that he drank 156 beers in one sitting he just had that much of a tolerance plus he was like 500 pounds so this one that one scene they had to lower this 500 pound drunken giant onto a horse and yeah, amazing stuff if you ever watched the Andre the Giant biographies Okay, number 13, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. If you're looking for the definitive live action movie to define the 80s, it's probably Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Every kid's fantasy come to life, you know, shrink down and go on an adventure in your own backyard. And again, another thing I've covered on this show before. The movie, just a few interesting things, it went through some several names, including The Backyard, which isn't bad, and then Teeny Weenies. But Disney wanted to let people know this wasn't a movie for little kids. And they went with the grammatically incorrect Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It should technically be Honey, I Shrank the Kids, but whatever. What's interesting about this movie is that it actually has some horror elements to it. You just might not have noticed it. Or maybe you did, depending on how much this movie freaks you out. It's quite violent at times and was actually directed by a horror film producer. And the premise, Disney was a little hesitant with this because they were sort of dipping their toe in the live action thing after doing so many cartoon movies. And they were a little tentative because the premise of this movie is children spending the entire movie not being killed. Um, you know, either way, though, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, beloved 80s movie and a surprise monster hit. They are, you know, they're obviously expecting everything to be a hit. This was a massive hit. It made the equivalent of around $460 million, which is a ton for something like that, that has more of a limited audience, if you think about it. There are a bunch of sequels, of course. None of them are originals hold, or the original is obviously still the best. There's 
the continuous talks about the new one, whatever that's going to be. I, I don't think it's a series. I think it's going to be a specific movie. Rick Moranis is supposedly involved. I'm, I know we'll keep our fingers crossed. I feel like we shouldn't hold our breath on this one because they've been talking about it for quite a while. Okay, number 14 is something I hadn't seen before, but as I was digging around Disney+, Plus, I found this National Geographic's docuseries called The 80s, The Decade That Made Us. I don't know if you've ever if you've seen this when it originally aired. It came out in 2013. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's got six different episodes, and it covers a lot of the relevant topics, like, you know, discuss on this show. It talks about the changing landscape of entertainment. It talks uh, one of the episodes is about the new era of money and entrepreneurs and how that relates to the wall street movie. It talks about fashion and the rise of Madonna and MTV. It talks about the cold war. It, it's, it's pretty good. So check that out. If you're a fan of the eighties, which I assume you are because you're listening to this show, uh, definitely look at that one. Okay, we've got just two more. Number 15, Three Men and a Baby. And a, another monster hit when it came out in 1987. I felt like everybody saw this movie. It was like a huge talking point thing. I mean, simple story. You got three roommates have their lives turned upside down when a baby shows up where they live. Seems more like the premise of a sitcom, but it worked well on the big screen, mostly because you had... Tom Selleck, Ted Danson, Steve Gutenberg, and that chemistry. It was actually the highest grossing film of 1987. The probably the most notable thing, again, depending on your age, is the sort of urban legend that there's a ghost captured in this movie. And people, you know, the word of mouth started spreading in the 80s and it led to it becoming the highest rented movie ever. People trying to see this ghost that's supposedly captured on film. Turns out it was just a cardboard cutout on the balcony, but for a short time, this was a big deal. <laughs> Trust me, I was totally caught up in this as a kid. Okay, last one here, Tron. The original Tron from 1982, if you can believe it goes back that far. This is another mind-blowing movie to a kid who grew up in the 80s. It's you know, made use of very early computer graphics. It's a story of a video game maker who gets accidentally transported into the mainframe of the computer he's working on, stars Jeff Bridges. And, you know, throughout the movie, he has to bring peace to this digital world he finds himself in. The concept is great. I think it would work in many eras of film and the then groundbreaking computer animation. It obviously looks dated but dare i say it still holds up and especially because the technology was used to serve the story it, it was also you know it was a showcase to show what the new technology was capable of but it was ultimately as is disney's priority story is king and i think in that sense even though it's you know crazy thing this movie is almost 40 years old I think it holds up even, even the technical aspects of it. But again, if it's been a while go, I was watching it earlier today and I was like, yeah, especially because it's remastered now on Disney plus. So if you have a good display or a 4k TV, this movie like really stands out now. And the, the computer imagery is obviously sharpened and enhanced. It, it looks amazing. So we'll finish it off there. That was a lot we covered. Uh, as of right now, this is this can always change, but this is what I found digging into every corner of Disney Plus. This is all the 80s content. I'm sure there might have been a few things I missed, and you know, I'm sure there'll be things that come and go and whatnot. Example, the Muppets Take Manhattan, which I would have covered and it used to be on, is now gone for some reason. So, you know, keep an eye. You can check back to the show if you need a refresher. But thank you for taking the time to listen. I appreciate you. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, so the fact you're listening to this one means a lot. But I will be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.